Today it emerged that everyone inside this trailer was a Chinese national. And the scene inside has been carefully preserved until the truck was driven into a hangar at nearby Tilbury Docks. Once out of sight, forensic analysis has taken over. All 39 people were in the trailer when it was driven onto the ferry at Zeebrugge on Tuesday and then collected by another cab and taken to the Perfleet Industrial Estate early yesterday morning when the bodies were discovered. This is where the difficult task has begun of identifying the 39 adults. Police now say eight of them are women and 31 are men. It's very likely to be a lengthy process, especially if, as is common in many of these people smuggling operations, none were carrying identification papers. Then comes the equally difficult challenge of tracing their families. It took many months to identify the 58 people who died in similar circumstances at Dover 19 years ago. Then, Bobby Chan, an immigration advisor in London, liaised between the Chinese communities and the authorities. Today, he finds himself reaching out yet again to those communities to spread the message. I'm saddened that, you know, they have done the same thing again, you know. They should have known that, you know, never go into a, a lorry, uh, refrigerated lorry like this one and, you know, die a horrible death. But this is another generation now, isn't it? It will be another generation. You'll be talking about normally probably in their 30s and 40s, uh, if not younger. There are a lot of villagers who are still being encouraged to come. You know, the snake hat will paint a very lovely place in this country with good wages and all sorts of things. That's what I'm the snakehead Mr Chan refers to is a Chinese term for a gang which specialises in human smuggling. Back in 2000, a mysterious woman known as Sister Ping was found to be the mastermind behind the operation which led to the deaths of the Dover 58. Today, there will be a different snakehead behind the Essex tragedy. The snakehead will be the local people in China to encourage people to go. I mean, as like in, at currently, I mean, every few years you, you hear rumours that, you know, there will be an amnesty in this country. They, they urge people to come to, 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 get the, to, to get yourself within the amnesty. And it happened every few years. I mean, the past was child... Whether that's true or not. It, it's definitely not true. I mean, China, Britain never have an amnesty. There have been rumours that, you know, when, when, when William get married, you have an amnesty. When a new government come into being, there's an amnesty. When Harry get married, there is an amnesty. That's, that's happened in the past. And people and, in China believe that? Well, how do you say it? They, there's no reason for them not to believe it. This may well be history repeating itself. In the case of the Dover 58, the mobile phone number of the contact they were supposed to meet was found on 27 of the bodies, written on scraps of paper or pieces of clothing. Who may have been destined to meet and greet the victims of this week's catastrophe will be one more line of inquiry in this murder investigation. Simon is reporting. Well, the village in County Amar, where the driver of the truck came from, is said to be in complete shock. Three properties in Northern Ireland have been raided, and the National Crime Agency is now investigating whether any organised crime groups were also involved. Our reporter, Claire Fallon, is just across the border in County Monaghan. Claire. More than 40 hours after the discovery of the bodies, of 39 people in the back of a lorry in Essex. And we've been told this evening that police have not yet requested the tracking data from an onboard GPS device. Now, we know that that data exists. We know that it was recording where the trailer had been in the hours and days before the bodies were discovered. But we've been told that police have not yet taken it to analyse it, even though it will, you would think, give them some fairly crucial information that may well help with their investigation. 
What we do know is that the trailer arrived into Essex during the early hours of yesterday morning, just after uh, midnight. We know that it came from Zeebrugge and we know that it's owned by a company that's based in Dublin called Global Trailer Rentals Limited. That company has told us that it was out on rent when all of this happened, that it was rented out just over a week ago. Uh, now, we've been talking to solicitors acting for that company throughout the day, and they're saying to us that on four occasions in the last two days, they've contacted police to offer them the tracking data, but that so far it hasn't been taken away to be analysed. Now, we have attempted to contact Essex Police. We've been asking them for information about this, for an explanation of some sort about why this data has not yet been taken to be analysed. They have not come back to us with a response yet, but, you know, there will be a lot of information that they have that they're not making public, and there will be a lot of evidence that they have to get through with this huge investigation. We have also been given a name for the person who we believe hired that trailer. And we're not naming them at this point in time. What I can say is they are involved with the haulage industry, not too far from where we are this evening. We attempted to speak to them today. We went to an address for them, but were very quickly told that we should leave. And there didn't appear to be any police activity at that address. But in areas where there has been police activity, as you said, there's a huge amount of alarm, really, at all of this. And earlier on, I spoke to Paul Berry. He's a unionist councillor in the area where the other man, uh, Mo Robinson, uh, lives. That's the man who's been arrested by police, a separate man from the person who we believe hired the trailer. And here's what Paul Berry had to say to me earlier today. We need to support the family at this time, the mother and father, who are clearly distraught. We need to give them their full support because they never expected uh, such news to land on their door. But we must also allow the Essex Police and now the PSNA to continue their inquiries and hope that the real perpetrators, whoever they may be, whether local or abroad, are brought to justice and that these individuals who, who, who were involved in this are brought before the courts and are locked up for many years to come. Well, although this is clearly a very fast-moving investigation, a huge investigation for Essex Police, there are some questions for them this, this evening about their investigation, but they are saying that they are focusing on what happened and they are asking anyone with any information to get in touch with them so as they can establish exactly what happened. Claire, thanks very much indeed. Well, today, another group of suspected migrants were detained at Zeebrugge port as they tried to climb a fence into a truck company compound. Officials there say it's highly unlikely that the 39 people who died were loaded into the trailer inside the port zone, insisting that seals and license plates are examined and checked by cameras before any refrigerated trailer can be loaded onto a ferry. From Zeebrugge, here's Paul O'Brien. The machinery of ports and borders in Zeebrugge on Tuesday became the backdrop for a catastrophic loss of life sealed up and hidden from view like in a coffin. So this is the Britannia dock in the giant port of Zeebrugge. Today we've been trying to get information from the Belgian authorities, trying to piece together what happened here on Tuesday. This morning we spoke to the Belgian prosecutor. He confirmed that at about 10 to 3 on Tuesday, the container with the 39 Chinese nationals arrived here at the dock, then that afternoon sailed for Parfleet. That was all the detail the prosecutor was in a position to give today. The rest was unknown. We don't know how much time he stayed on the Belgian territory. We don't know if it stops or not. We don't know if the people get in the container in Belgium or not. So we have a lot of questions. Also today, the mayor of this area and the president of the Port Authority here spoke to journalists and he said that he believed that the people in that container had passed away before they arrived here at Zeebrugge. When you are with 39 people in that box, uh, within some hours there is a, a, a mac mess of uh, oxygen in it and uh, I think it will be your death, especially when the uh, temperature is then going on from uh, minus 5 until minus 25 degrees, that's the possibility of such the tracks. 
The chairman of the Port Authority is convinced that the 39 people entered the truck some distance from the port and that heat scanning technology didn't pick them up because they had already passed away. From here you can see how the logistics would have worked on Tuesday afternoon. Containers from all over Europe brought to the port. The cab unit decouples from the container then is loaded onto a ferry by a small tractor unit. The big logistics picture, 4,000 trucks leave Zeebrugge a day. On Tuesday, one of them was a hearse. About 60% of the freight that leaves Zeebrugge here is destined for the UK and Ireland. But of course, the big question now is where did that container originate the container that arrived here on Tuesday afternoon and exactly when did the 39 people inside when did they get into that container we don't know the answers to that questions but if there are clues to be had they are perhaps in that case back in 2000 that Simon Israel was talking about earlier in the program and what was uniquely challenging about that particular case was the fact that the Chinese criminal networks had subcontracted out a section of the human trafficking journey to European criminal networks. And it's that interface, that fault line, is the one that will represent a unique challenge for police across Europe investigating this tragic case. Parker Bryan there, thank you very much indeed. So what is it like attempting a journey across countries, across continents, stuck inside a lorry with dozens of others in the most perilous of states? Well, in 2016, two Afghan brothers, seven-year-old Ahmed and his older brother Jawad, were smuggled to the UK in a refrigerated lorry when the oxygen inside began to run out. They both join me now. Welcome to the program. Now, let me start with you, Jawad. When you listen, when you watch this terrible, tragic story of those 39 people who died, yeah. what goes through your mind? I was uh, with my friend. Uh, he drove me to home, and I listened to radio. And when I hear this, I was physically inside the car and mentally I was inside the lorry, you know. I was feeling I'm inside the lorry with these 39 people. You're and back in your experience? Yeah, back, back to experience. And I was thinking, oh my God, I come back to there. How deep these people go out? And then I said, maybe I'm dying, you know. I'm, I'm not alive. How many people were stuck inside your lorry? Uh, 15 people. 15 people. And how long were you together in that lorry? Uh, 14 hours, 14, 15 hours we were. And it was refrigerated? Refrigerated, yeah. So how cold was it? I don't think people can imagine what that's like. From, from beginning, it was very cold. That we put the sleeping bag. But in the end, become, after two, three hours, it became hard, hard, because the, uh, uh, the oxygen uh, hair is uh, stopped and not working. Then uh, we become harder, harder, you know, and we take out our jacket and blank right. it out. So the problem for you wasn't the cold, it was the lack of oxygen. Yeah, first from the beginning we, we felt cold, but the, in the end we get uh, warm because the, the oxygen ran away and we couldn't breathe very well. Were you scared, Ahmed? Yes, very much. And did the, did the driver of the lorry explain to you exactly what was happening? No. He didn't? No. He, he just used bad language and he used to stop and then come and then swear at us. Because you were shouting or because you weren't yeah. behaving as you wanted no, you to because, behave? Or? Because we were shouting and uh, trying to get out of the lorry. And when you were stuck inside that, that lorry, it must have been so terrifying. Yeah. To wonder how long it would take. Yeah. Tell me, did he explain to you I'm just curious about this. Did he explain it's now going to be cold? You know, you might you know, have difficulty breathing. Was there any sort of explanation or were you just herded into that truck? No, they just uh, put us to lorry and they said, they're going to take you like five hours, six hours, mm -hmm. but this take us 14 hours. And the, the lorry driver is not uh, stopped. Uh, we, uh, we called the driver, please stop, but he, he, he wasn't. He ignored you? No, he just ignored and just, sometimes he stopped, he's just shouting and said, don't, I will drop you, I will drop you. And so how did you finally get hurt? You had to make a phone call to someone in, yeah. in Calais, right? Yeah, yeah, my brother, he's called uh, a volunteer and he, uh, the lady was uh, named uh, Les Kilek. She was in the New York and about the conference about the women and children in that time. And she called the 
Yeah. England police. Yeah. Or, and uh, I mean, uh, you were only seven years old at the time, Ahmed. Yeah. When you were going through this very terrifying experience, did you think to yourself, I want to live through this, this is worth it, it's worth it? Or did you think, why am I here? Yeah. And so, uh, can you explain it again, please? Did you, when, at the time, yeah. did you understand why you were doing this, why you were stuck yeah. in the lorry? You did? Yeah, because I, because I was running away from danger and mm -hmm. trying, to, uh, trying to get to the safety. You were running away from the danger yeah. of war in Afghanistan? Yeah. And did you ever, Jawad, think, this isn't worth it? This isn't worth the risk that we're taking? I was thinking, but not that much, you know. I was <laughs> thinking maybe it's a dangerous journey, but uh, not that much dangerous. We, if someone put you in lorry and locked the lorry mm. behind you. And this is at the end of a really long journey, right? Yes. So the, the whole journey took, what, seven months? Six, seven months, yeah. Six, seven months. Yeah, we walk in and uh, by terrain, by sheep, you know. And was the most dangerous part of the journey the last 14 hours in the truck? This is the first, and we had the before as well, you know, the police shot, uh, shoot us, you know, in, the, in the Turkey. Mm -hmm. They want to kill us because we want to cross from Iran to Turkey. But it's not just, this is like very simple journey we had. What would you say to people, you know, in Afghanistan or indeed any, anywhere else in the world, in China, who are thinking of doing the same journey? What would you say to them today? If their life is not too much danger, they should, they should stay in their home country. They should stay in their country? Yeah, but if their life is danger, they, they are their choice too. They want to stay or they want to leave. So this is a calculation, the risk of staying at home yeah. under fire the risk, and the uh, risk of the journey. How risk is too much? If, uh, they, if they stay in the mm. country, is risk higher or if it, it, mm. you know, Do you like living in Britain, Ahmed? Yeah, I'm happy living here and going to school. What do you like about it? I, I like about going to school and uh, learning things, mm. yeah. You support a football team? Uh, no. OK, all right. I play <laughs> cricket. You play cricket? Yeah. OK, good. All right. Ahmed and Jawad, thank you very much for coming on the programme.